this morning we're going to tackle kind of James is the book of James I love and I hate. Anybody else besides me? I love it because it's practical, but I hate it because it points out my struggle, my difficulty, my issues. It talks a lot about me in there. And this morning, we're going to be looking at, once again, our speech, our how we address each other, how we talk to each other. And before I, I get into the text that we're going to look at, which if you have your Bibles, open them to James chapter 4. We're only going to deal with two verses, 11 and 12, to this morning. But um, back in James chapter 3, just to give us a reminder of the power of our tongue, uh, I want to just remind you by reading James chapter 3, verse 5, and, uh, and just a little bit following. But James says this, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is, it is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. That's pretty powerful. When we think about the power that we have in our tongue. That it can set a whole forest on fire. You know, all we got to do is look around our state and we can see the effects of forest fires. Florence is, you know, even though they've kind of eased restrictions, the wind can change and an entire town can be wiped off the face of the earth. With the power of our tongue. With the power of our tongue, you know, it literally, the Bible tells us it has life and death within it. A struggling relationship struggles even more when we don't watch our tongue. doesn't matter if it's a... a just people who know each other at work and they're casual or best friends, wives and husbands, children. The power of our tongue can destroy us. As we fail to recognize how much power we really have in words. James is now going to address it. And, you know, a lot of times we were like, you know, why, why does it keep repeating things over and over in the Bible? Because and the honest truth is there's nothing new in there from Genesis to Revelation, okay? It basically says the same thing over and over and over again. And I know this may be offensive to some of you, but do I need to speak the truth? Okay. Human beings are stupid. We do the same things over and over and over again, and the Bible keeps addressing them over and over and over again in our lives. We just, I mean, we struggle. Anybody else? I mean, I say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And what do I do? I do it. You know, I'm going to really watch my tongue. I'm going to be nice today. I'm not going to say anything that's, you know, and I do it. That's why the Bible keeps addressing it. Whether it's our tongue or the way we live, the way we love. I mean, we just, sometimes, you know, I mean, I think some of us are just, you know, like me, just Irish. Okay, we got to be hit over and over and over again. Okay? I mean, if you noticed last night, I only saw the highlights, but, you know, I listen, I was proud of McGregor. Okay? He stood there and he took a punch over and over and over again. Guys, that's the way we are. So as we look at this this morning, I want us to have this idea of the power of our tongue. Life and death. Blessing or curses is what he goes on to say. So if you look with me, in James chapter 4, beginning, or, yeah, beginning in verse 11, James says, Do not speak. Against one another, brethren. 
He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? When we think of this, these are some pretty heavy words. You know, he goes from, with an abrupt shift from describing an appropriate attitude and and relationship with God, James turns to a proper relationship between us as believers. Us, really, when he says neighbor, it goes beyond just those that are in the church. It now goes to those that surround us. We love God by being humble for him. That's what we found out last week. And listen, Jesus said we love our neighbor. Or James says here, we love our neighbor by refusing to speak evil of him. To speak about him. To speak evil, you know, guys, can take many forms. We may speak the truth about a person but be unkind about it. The Bible says we're to speak truth in anger. Amen? Is that what it says? We're to speak truth harshly. Is that what it says? Speak the truth in love. Or we may spread gossip. that otherwise we have no business knowing. You see, when we live in close proximity to people and we worship with them and we get to know them, we learn things about them. Husbands and wives and children and, you know, everybody's uh, got a problem but me, amen? I'm the only perfect one in the, in the relationship. So that gives me the right to gossip. You know, we may begin to question someone's authority and nullify it by backbiting. There's a lot of ways that we can speak evil and a lot of ways that we can destroy people. We can murder someone's reputation with one little tidbit of gossip. We can take things out of context and, and, and out of the relationship that, that things are set in and destroy people. You know, the other day I was talking with, with one of the, someone I'm very close with and have known and been a part of their life for 20 years and issue of gossip and things said. And, you know, I say it to a lot of you. You know, we were in a parking lot. Nobody knew who we were and, and, and things, you know. But as I we left this, our little chit-chat as we had in the parking lot as we passed, the simple word was, I love you, was said. Now listen, if I say it within the church, no one thinks anything of it. But if I say it out there, am I having an affair? They laughed. That was said of me. Did you know that? Not here. I've shared this story before. But you know, my sister is 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 beautiful. My sister is gorgeous. And about 15 years ago, actually, it'd be, yeah, about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when my dad was dying, my sister and I were having an intense conversation at a coffee shop. She's crying. I'm telling her I love her. She's struggling in her marriage. Things are, and by the time, not this church, okay, it'd be actually 20 years ago now. By the time I arrived at the church, I was a youth pastor on Sunday morning. I was having a full-blown affair. Everybody knew it wasn't Lisa. My sister's almost six foot tall. 
intently looking into a beautiful woman's face and telling her that you love her and that it's going to be okay and that you'll be there for her and that you'll walk through her with whatever she goes through and you know all the emotions that go with your dad dying and all of that. So on Sunday morning, I introduced the woman I was having an affair with. I introduced my sister. One word, though, could have destroyed my reputation. One thing taken out of context. Because we have to be so careful with our speech. When we think about those that that do have authority, you know, whether it's a pastor or an elder or a Sunday school teacher or a, a small group leader and those people, we have to be so careful with the words that we use. And listen, I understand that, that as a leader, all the decisions that I make are always perfect and right and in accordance with God's will. Amen? I've never made a mistake in my life. I know everybody's always happy with every decision that's made. I know that's a lie. I know that I'm fallible and that, that I make bad decisions and, and choices and, and sometimes people aren't happy with the decisions that are made. And, and, they, and we have to be so careful because within the church body it can cause such controversy. I praise God we don't have a lot of that that goes on here. So don't think I'm, this is going to be the pony that I'm going to ride, okay? I'm not, but it needs to be said. I'm finding out that, that, that one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life is being a pastor. Right now, uh, and this is, a pra- this is a huge praise. And sometimes we struggle on Sunday morning and in the summer, this Sunday morning, we would have no problem with it. But literally, okay, looking back because we keep track of things, in six months, we've doubled attendance. Wow. Between all three campuses, Doubled attendance. Okay, that's like being married to 300 people or having 300 children. I had three and couldn't keep all three of them happy at the same time. I mean, we don't think of it that way, but but that's so true in what we do. Because you think you've communicated clearly and, and concisely and, and have everything out there only to find out that you're hearing over here or over there. That, and it's like, I thought I covered that. Because sometimes we all have selective hearing, don't we? I wear hearing aids, so sometimes my batteries go dead. That's a good excuse, amen? Went into a meeting last week with... with uh, the folks at Manhattan, and I had to call time out halfway through the meeting because my hearing aids batteries went dead, and it was like, I can't hear a word of this. Just talk amongst yourselves. Guys, the idea of us in our speech is so careful. We have to be careful about it. You know, obviously the hurts, that, that obviously this hurts the unity of the church and believers. The idea of our speech and backbiting and talking about bad about one another. And, and you know, listen, I can t- begin to speak evil against... I've been married for 31 years last week. 31 years. I want you to know I'm passionately, madly in love with my wife. I think even more so than I was the day that I married her. But in a week, I can convince myself that I need to divorce her. In one or two days, you can convince yourself you need to leave a church and break its fellowship. This type of speech has huge effects on our life. Paul, writing to the church in Corinthians 12, says this in 2 Corinthians 12, says this in verse 20. For I am afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find, and you won't like my response. I'm afraid that I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and and disorderly behavior. Wow. 
expect to find that in a church. We expect to find it, you know, quote, in, 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 the, in families. I mean, he just described family life with kids, teenagers especially. But he says this is happening in the church. The way this is going, play, James writes this out in the Greek. He's writing it out in the tense, gives us the idea that it reveals that it's currently going on in the church. That they're backbiting and they're talking against each other. And, and, and there's these quarrels and there's this, this just this underlying current that's taking place. The people are in a habit of criticizing one another. And it destroys churches and fellowships and friendships and marriages. We have to be so careful about our speech. This verse includes the sixth and the seventh, the sixth and seventh time. This is this verse includes um, the law of God. James mentions it six, and now is the sixth and the seventh time within this verse. It is the royal law, the law that frees or convicts. It's the law that must be kept. And here, it's the law that's under attack. This specific problem being con confronted violates the ninth commandment, the law of God. The ninth one. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. We don't think of it in those terms. When we begin to, to gossip and we begin to backbite and we begin to find fault and we begin to just to, to speak evil against someone. It also violates more importantly, I believe, the fundamental law of Christ. Love your neighbor as yourself. Is there anyone here who likes to hear that there's people talking about them? That likes to find out there's gossip going around? Does anybody here like to know that, that you know, someone thinks they're not doing the job correctly and is sharing it with everybody? I don't think there's one of us who really likes that. Love your neighbor as yourself. But yet so many of us are guilty of that. Jesus called, love your neighbors yourself, the second greatest commandment. How are we doing? How are you doing in your marriage? Are the words uplifting? Are they edifying? Are they encouraging? How about in your friendships? How about in the relationship with your kids? Do they build them up or tear them down? See, we have to take this to, to a practical standpoint because somebody may be here, be able to say, Whew, I've never said anything bad about anybody in church. But your coworkers, your wife, your children... Your family? James added, went from, you know, brothers and sisters. Brothers, don't, don't speak against evil against each other. Relationship with them. And then he brought it to neighbors. If a believer speaks against another believer, it, he is criticizing and, and condemning the law because he is not showing love and is not treating others as he would like to be treated. Our disobedience, guys, listen, shows disregard for the law of God. We are passing judgment on its validity. Don't talk bad about me, but I'll talk bad about you. Because we put ourselves above the law. By doing so, we are putting ourselves above the law of God. And ultimately putting ourselves above God. When we judge one another in this slanderous way, we are clearly failing to submit to God. As this is a huge issue. Submitting to God. 
putting ourselves in his place. Too often we cry out, oh God, I want a Lord, I want a Savior. And all we want really is to be saved from the pit of hell and not place Christ genuinely on the seat in the throne of our heart. We still struggle with me, myself, and I. Jesus summarizes the law as love for God and others. And Paul said that, the, that, that love demonstrated towards a neighbor would fully satisfy the law. In Romans chapter 13. When we fail to love, we are actually, actually breaking God's holy law. We don't think of it in those terms, guys. Listen, we need to examine our attitudes and actions towards others. Do you build them up or do you tear them down? Those are, those are huge things for us to consider. They're huge. You know, we need to think of it this way. When we're ready to criticize somebody, we need to remember God's law of love and say something good instead. Did you get that? Listen, it's easy to criticize. It takes intentionality and purpose to say something good. It's easy to pick somebody's faults out. It's harder to die to yourself and look for that which is good and speak good. To encourage one another, to build them up. If I begin to criticize Lisa and I do it publicly or in a small group, everybody will agree, oh, those are her shortcomings. Because they're evident. If you get it and do the same for me, she could do the same for me. And guess what all I'll see eventually? And all I'll hear, and I'll be built up, and I'll feel. We've all been in those circles, haven't we? And James said earlier that those things lead to murder. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. Because let me ask this what is more important? Myself and what I want, or God and what He wants. We have to be careful with our words. James says in verse 12 there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you? God alone is both the source and the enforcer of his law, guys. You don't know how many times, you know, these things come. I'll, I'll go straighten them out. Anybody know what I'm saying? I'll go fix it. And pretty soon I feel the Holy Spirit really grab a hold of me. And it's like, no, don't say a word. You let me do my job. You let me do my job. I'm the author and the enforcer. Now listen, we who are accountable to God's law cannot place ourselves above God or His law. Listen, there's so many times that we, we, we want to run ahead of God. And we begin to speak and instead of speaking in love, we speak out of anger and jealousy, selfish ambition. Listen, God rewards those who obey the law and destroys those who disobey it. Jesus said this, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. 
Too often we want to run ahead of God and begin to speak, you know, truth into somebody's life. Instead of looking for the opportunity and watching God at work and joining him in that and seeing it, we rush into it. And what we do is we divide and we conquer and we destroy. We have to be careful with our speech and how, it, how it's used. James also takes away any rights we might claim for criticizing our neighbors. Behind the critical spirit is an attitude that usurps God's authority and ultimately is full of pride. I know what's best. I know how to straighten this out. Guys, listen, that's full of pride. There should be no critical or harsh fault finding in the body of Christ amongst brothers and sisters. The principle in this verse does not prohibit, listen, does not prohibit the actions of a church against a member who is acting and fragrantly disobedient, who's, who's way out there, who's running amok amok, and, and, and not following God's plan. Listen, it doesn't take away the action of the church to come alongside and say, brother, sister, But those are things that have to be prayerfully and thoughtfully and, and entered into with fear and trepidation. Listen, those things can be entered into in a relationship that's right. It's amazing what happens when you shoot, truly show someone you care. How you can speak truth into their life. But too often, truth is not in love. It's harsh. Rather, James is concerned with the critical speech that condemns or judges others' actions and their standing with God. How can that person be saved? I don't even think they're saved. I've heard that said. How could a saved person commit such an evil? Listen, I want to tell you, saved people commit just as much evil as the lost person can. That's true. Too often we want to question even their spirituality, their relationship with God. He is confronting individuals who might be tempted to set themselves up as the personal watchdogs of others' behavior and even the behavior of the church. Listen, God's the one who judges. We have to be so careful how we behave and what we say. We might think that or just criticizing a church member, or spreading a little interesting gossip is not as serious, especially when it is compared to other sins that are within the Bible. But the Bible sees it as a sin of the utmost seriousness because it breaks the law of love and tries to usurp God's authority. As we saw in chapter 3, the tongue is a tool of, of deadly sin. And we must not dare men, minimize its effect within the body within marriages and families and relationships. God is simply saying to us, to you and to me, Curtis, you love them, I'll judge them. You love them, I'll judge them. Paul, writing in Romans, says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Guys, listen, our job is simply to love. To love, not judge them, not speak against them, but to love them. Now listen, lo love is not passive, okay? 
Listen, if, if I know I have a friend, a brother or sister that, that's headed down the wrong path, in love, what should I do? I should pray for them. I should encourage them. And yes, I should even speak truth into their life. In love. I normally find when I'm aggravated is not the time to speak things in love. I speak things in Curtis at that point. After much prayer is the time to speak. Pondering even the words that you're going to say. Speaking the truth in love. We are not to judge the motives or the intent of someone's heart. That's where I get in trouble. Our job is simply to love. Let me ask, how are we doing at loving one another? Husbands, wives, church members, parents, children. How are we doing at love? Because see, if we're loving right, our tongue will be under control. We'll be loving God. We will be loving others.